Carlo Russo, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks, pal. It's an honor. Yeah, it's my pleasure. So we go back a ways, like 20 years. Um, in fact, yeah. you are the first, you, you're the painter of the first painting that I ever bought, at least significant painting that I ever bought. And that was that still life at the Armory show, like in, what was that, like 2003 or something? I think it was like maybe 2005. Was it? Uh, okay. I was showing the fan gallery and um, he, you know, he would do the armory shows every year. And yeah, I walk in and my mom was, my mom was there and she was like, Hey, you know, I just met this guy, Jeff or whatever. And he, he bought one of your paintings and I'm like, Oh wow, that's so weird. <laughs> and then, you know, there you go. So yeah. that was pretty cool. Yeah. I still love that painting. It's in my living room. Um, love it. Your first school was PAFA. What is, what does that stand for? That's the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. Okay. Um, and was that a traditional school? Was it more modern school focused? Yeah, no, no, it's, it's traditional. So like, you know, it's got a very long history. PAFA is like, you know, the first or, or you know, the, one of the first arts colleges or universities in America, you know, Thomas Aikens was an instructor there, you know, so it has a very long you know, lineage, um, uh, you know, going, going pretty far back, you know, <laughs> That's so, embarrassing. Uh, I haven't heard, I hadn't heard of it. I'm, I'm clueless. <laughs> I mean, I, listen, when I got there, I didn't even know, I, I, somebody, I joked, uh, somebody named Thomas Aikens and I, I said, who? And, and he laughed at me. I, I was like, oh, kind of felt like a <laughs> dope, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I was, I was in, I was very much a newbie, you know, I was just getting into this like whole world of painting and, you know, so. So you just kind of got lucky then if you didn't even know what you were stepping into, if you didn't even recognize that Thomas Aikens had been a teacher there and has this long history. Was it just dumb luck that you showed up at this school? Well, uh, you know, it wasn't dumb luck. I mean, so, you know, I, I was at Art Institute and I, you know, this was like towards the end of 1999. And um, I sort of had the idea already that I just didn't really want to go into that field. So I took a tour of the academy and I knew it was an older school. I mean, I didn't know, you know, the dates and so forth. I know it had been around a long time, you know, well over a hundred years. And, you know, I walked in and I saw the cast hall and this, this giant cast hall with you know, dozens and dozens of casts and a life-size replica of, uh, of, uh, Michelangelo's David. And, um, that kind of like cinched the deal for me right there. Um, and, wow. um, yeah, so it was pretty, uh, not, not so much luck. I mean, you know, one of my classmates at, at the art Institute went to PAFA. She was a, um, she was a, a painter. Um, I mean, she was an abstract painter, but she, she went there anyway. And, um, she's the one that kind of told me about it and, um, sort of got me interested. Hmm. So at what yeah. point did you realize what you had? I mean, other than seeing the cast and everything, at what point did you really recognize this lineage and what it had to offer that? Cause that's really different than most artists experience, especially at that point in time in the early 2000s. Yeah, well, I think, you know, once you get there, you know, you kind of, you get to know, you know, the buildings and the museum and the lineage and the, the you start to learn about the history and it, it takes time to learn about all of that. You know, it, didn't, it doesn't happen all at once, but, um, you know, shortly after I got there, I realized, you know, this is a pretty, pretty cool place. And, um, um, you know, I met some teachers that were like-minded <clears throat> you know, that were interested in teaching um, the kind of art that I wanted to, you know, get, get good at and, um, mm -hmm. or, you know, to, to learn about. And, um, you know, I guess, you know, I guess the sort of the rest is history, you know, I just, I did four years there and, you know, um, I, you know, I got a good, I feel like I got a, a, a good foundation, you know, uh, especially with drawing. I think like drawing was the area I, I feel like it really helped, you know, train me. 
So you were born and raised in Pennsylvania, correct? Correct. Yeah. Yes. What part? How far from Philly? Um, in and around Philly area. I mean, for most of my life. Okay. Okay. And you're still there yeah. currently? Yeah. So, so I am uh, a little bit south of Philadelphia now. I'm about a half hour, um, you know, it's about 25 miles south of Philadelphia. There's a small town nearby called Media. And um, we live, you know, sort of not, not right in the town, sort of out in the borough uh, in, in Media. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, it's so what about your childhood? Did you always know you wanted to be an artist? Um, good question. I, I don't know if I, I wanted to be a lot of things when I was a kid. I mean, you know, I had all kinds of wild ideas of things I wanted to do as a child. I mean, I don't know if being an artist was one of them. Um, I don't even know if it sort of hit, it didn't really even hit me even as an adult that I, I could be an artist for a living, you know, it's it sort of, it just sort of like crept up on me. And, you know, it was like my junior year at PAFA, it was like, oh, wow, maybe I can actually, you know, do something with this. So, um, wait a minute, let me get this clear. You know, so I, you went to, you're at your second art school and that's when yeah. you realize maybe there's something you can do with this. Yeah. I mean, obviously like, like my whole life, I've always been interested in art and drawing. Yeah. I've always had a pencil or, you know, something, a paintbrush or something in my hands. Um, I really didn't know like what kind of, you know, what kind of outlet I wanted for sort of any, you know, creativity <laughs> or, or, uh, you know, whatever, whatever is doing at the time, I, I just didn't really know, um, you know, I was doing like, there was a period I went and just, I was like doing graffiti and like, you know, things that are very not what I'm doing now. You know what I mean? Like in high school, for instance, I barely made any art, but I did lots of graffiti, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, so I went through, um, you know, sort of different phases and, um, um, you know, then I was sort of looking for an outlet and I went to, um, uh, fashion design school at, at Art, Art Institute. And I was like, you know, maybe this is something that, that could, uh, could sort of, uh, you know, a way I can express some, you know, whatever I was trying to express, whatever creativity or, you know, sort of, um, you know, impulses I had, uh, to create art. I thought maybe I could do it through that. Um, but then, you know, it, again, that shifted. And then I went to PAFA and um, then I started getting into, you know, drawing and painting. And that that just felt like home to me. You know, when I, start, when I started drawing more and, um, you know, painting, you know, it's just that was a different feeling. And um, I sort of recognized that pretty early on that, um, you know, that could be the route for me. You know, it, it was. So I'm really struggling to understand this because <laughs> you went to an exceptional school and before that an art school that many would yeah. argue is also exceptional. And then, but you didn't know you wanted to be an artist. I mean, I don't understand how do, how do most people would just go to a state school and just get their generals out of the way while they kind of figure life out. How did you end up in multiple art schools before? and not know you want to be an artist that doesn't well let's put it this way i <laughs> um I, I i didn't think that far ahead um it, you know I, I was sort of like like after i graduated high school you know i was kind of you know i didn't have a lot of direction i didn't have a lot of aim you know i went to i went to community college off and on for about a year um you know i was a terrible student there i i didn't often i didn't even want, really want to go to class um you know, so I, I didn't have a lot of direction or a lot of aim. I, I knew or I had an inkling that I could maybe do something with art because art was a sort of a lifelong interest of mine, but really didn't know that I could even be a painter. You know, the idea of being a painter for a living was, I mean, it really didn't occur to me, you know, and, mm -hmm. 
so, you know, it was really, um, you know, after, you know, maybe it was a little bit of luck or, you know, who knows, but somehow I landed, landed at Art Institute, which sort of led me to PAFA, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's yeah, just so interest. Think, you're just interested in art and you're like, I don't know what else to do. I don't like going to community college. I'm just going to go to an art school. Yeah. Like, like my, my mother, certainly she, she always encouraged me to do something artistic, you know, some, some field of art, whether it was, you know, I mean, she didn't like tell me specifically, but you know, you know like a lot of kids, they don't know what to do. Maybe they go in graphic design or maybe they want to get into animation or something. It's just, you know, so I didn't really, really know what direction to go. I just knew something, you know, that I didn't want to like, you know, I don't want to work in an office, you know, yeah. I, 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 I worked in a, you know, before, um, before I graduated from PAFA, I was, I worked for a mortgage company for about a year and, um, you know, and I just, I realized I'm like, you know, I don't, I don't, this is not, you know, what I want to do. I don't want to sit behind a desk and, you know, sort of the office life. I just, I didn't want to do that. So, um, um, but yeah, so I, I, you know, it's a, it's a long, strange, you know, maybe it's a little bit, a little bit of luck, like I said, how sort of I ended up you know, where I did, but, um, yeah. I mean, isn't it always a little bit of luck? I mean, a lot of people, a lot of artists go on and I'm not discounting this, but a lot of artists talk about how much work it is and how they earned it. And I'm, you know, I mean, even down to being born with an aptitude, I feel like is a, a lot of luck, you know, sometimes it just, things just work out. But I yeah. mean, your decision is so far removed from mine. That's why I'm kind of fascinated by this or your, your life path so different than mine, even down to your mother wanted you to do something in art. Were you, yeah. were, did you grow up with both parents or just your mom? Uh, so I, both parents just for a while. Um, when I was, when I was about, oh, I guess I was about 12 or 13. I moved in with my mom full time. My, my parents had divorced when I was young. I moved in with my mom full time, you know, and I, she lived in Philly and, um, you know, my dad was like, um, he was more the practical kind of guy. Like he, um, he was a computer programmer, like from the old school days. And, um, um, you know, he always thought like, you know, I should do something with the trades. You know, he wanted me to go into the trades. Uh, you know, and I remember telling my mom, like, like, you know, my dad, dad said I should go to plumbing school. And she like, she was like, she like, no, no. <laughs> like, are you kidding me? She's like, you're gonna, I mean, no, nah, she just didn't like that idea one bit. Um, just cause she's, I'm and, assuming cause she saw the talent that you had and thought what, you know, what a waste if to not use this talent that you have. Is that why? I guess. I guess. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's the only reason that I can think of. She, she was always very supportive in that realm. She let me live at home the whole time I was going through <laughs> six straight years of school. So I, you know, I, I lived at home a lot longer than a lot of people did. Um, but you know, I did that to save money. Cause you know, I, I, I also have, I do have a practical side too. Right. Um, didn't want to graduate with gazillions of dollars in, of, of student loans. And so. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Like I said, I, so I knew I wanted to be an artist since the second grade. I mean, one thing I think, uh, we share is I didn't know what, I didn't even know what a painter was. So yeah. therefore I couldn't know that I wanted to be a painter. I just knew I wanted to be an artist, but I ended up in a yeah. state school, um, garbage school. And my parents <laughs> begged me not to be an artist. They yeah. just begged me <laughs> like, they call me naive and tell me how ridiculous my, it was and how immature and I needed to be practical, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> practical. We love that word practical. I you know. know. Like around. Yeah. Yeah. They sound a little bit more like your father was. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, that's great. I, it's, um, I'm, um, I'm really uh, a little bit envious of, of your path. It sounds amazing. There's a strange path, strange and, you know, strange and unlikely and it's like you know 
you, you go on this path, it's like you, you, have, you have you have no idea what you're getting into. It's like, I mean, it's just you know, I, I just jumped in, and um, like I said, I, I didn't really <laughs> know what to expect. Um, I didn't really have any other, um, you know. Again, I, I wanted to do something with art, but I just didn't really have a direction, and this mm -hmm. just natural fit, you know, because I always drew. Drawing has been something I've, I mean, from the minute I could, you know, use my hand and hold a pencil, you know, I've been drawing. So, so drawing, there was always some natural, you know, urge and, you know, I guess a little bit, little ability. Um, I just didn't really have any training, you know, until right. I got to path. And then, you know, then when I got to path, I actually got some training and, you know, my teacher, one of my teachers, uh, a guy named Kevin Llewellyn, he, he kind of taught me, you know, that, the, I like to call it the science behind drawing. And so he, he, he was sort of like my, my first, uh, what I think of as my really first important teacher in, in, you know, this, this practice of traditional drawing and, and painting. And, uh, he taught me, you know, via the cast hall, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the science of drawing. Yeah. So did they do the whole sight size thing with the cast or was it different? Well, he did. Yeah, I was lucky. Uh, I was lucky I landed on Kevin as a teacher because he taught sight sizing. Um, not all the teachers did. Um, there was a lot of uh, the, the thing to know about PAFA is while it's, you know, it's, it's called the Pennsylvania Academy. And it, I think for a long time it was an academy in the sense of, you know, sort of a, a certain training you know, towards building the skills of a, a realist artist or, you know, painter, drafts and whatever. You know, we all, we also live in, you know, being in the later 20th century, you had a lot of teachers there that had no interest in um, that, you, you know, they're into abstract art, conceptual art, you know, just basically like postmodern art. And, you know, so I, I got lucky and I just got a teacher who, teach, you know, or I should say taught sight sizing and, you know, sort of a very, you know, the, the, the basic fundamentals, you know, about like single light source and, you know, uh, measuring and, you know, plumb line and, you know, all the, all the basics that you learn with, with you know, sight sizing and, and cast drawing, he taught me all that. And um, he was an amazing teacher. And uh, I, I feel like, again, it's luck. I mean, I could have gotten a lot of people like, you know, I could have landed with a, of any number of teachers. I just happened to run into this guy. And um, that's why I feel like it is such a such a strange and, you know, in some ways, unlikely journey, you know. Mm -hmm. Do you still so, use that method today, sight size in your work? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I use sight size quite a bit. Um, I don't always measure um, as much as I do. Like um, when I'm doing like you know, typical like setup still lifes, um, or even if I'm doing like a portrait head, you know, I, I can measure, um, I, I'll take measurements. Um, but like for flowers and, and floral painting, I just I sort of measure by eye, you know, mm -hmm. but, um, so I, but I feel like I always use some version of sight sizing in my work today. Um, you know, 20, here we are 20 years later. Yeah. So, Okay, so tell me about your post college journey. How did you? I mean, you you can do everything. I've seen you do portraits, I've seen you do the figure. I don't know if I've seen any landscapes, but I've seen lots of still lifes. How, but you seem to focus and have a love for still life. How did you land on that? Um, wow, good question. Um, I think, I think early on it became obvious, at least to me that it was what I was best at and it's what I liked the most. Um, when I went to PAFA initially, um, like I knew about Sargent, for instance, I knew, I knew Sargent's work and I loved Sargent's work. I, I mean, I still do. And, but I, 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 like in my mind, I was like, oh, I wanna be Sargent, you know, I wanna paint portraits. Um, and then once I got there, um, that, that sort of wore off on me, um, that, that feeling wore off, I should say you know, in portrait class or figure class, like I enjoyed it, but I liked being in front of, I, I found that I just liked being in front of objects better. Um, really? 
Yeah, isn't it weird? Um, <laughs> no, it's not weird. It's just fascinating the people's temperament. I, I interviewed Brian Mark Taylor. In fact, I just posted his uh, yesterday. Um, and the, for those watching, that will be like two months ago by the time you're posted. <laughs> but but anyway, I interviewed Brian Mark Taylor, and he said, uh, you know, he had a similar draw to landscape. It was like he's just he just lives for the landscape, and I just yeah. live for the figure. And it's just interesting how our temperaments are so different and how yeah. for some reason, whatever that is, and it might be a variety of reasons, we sort of are just drawn to some subject matter for some reason. I don't, it's, it's kind of interesting. Yeah. You know, it's, and it's, it's nice though, but you know, there's a place for everybody in this, in this, this world of art, you know, whether you like painting heads or people or, you know, things, you know, there's, there's, there's a, you know, a place for everyone. And, um, you know, it, it just turned out that that was something I like to do. And it, I, I felt that I was doing that better than I was doing anything else also. I, so I think it was like an extra motivator. Mm -hmm. I, um, you know, I just, the attention to the little details and texture and all that stuff, it just, that to me, that just never gets old, you know? Yeah. So. And you have incredible attention to detail. That's one thing I've noticed. One of the things I've seen you paint before is uh, fur, and we're we're gonna come back to your art in a minute. Um, but I just because I'm commenting on this, I just wanted to point out um, because when I've seen you paint fur, I don't yeah. know how the heck you do it. It's mind blowing. You know, oh. I'm not sure what it is you're doing to make it feel. Like I can, I mean, if it's like I can literally reach out and touch it and just pet that fur. So when you say this attention to detail, yeah, you definitely have a gift for that. Yeah, I definitely well, appreciate that. Thank you. I, I uh, you know, it's nice of you to say. And um, yeah, you know, that's that's maybe that's just you know, it's it's a you know, it's a What's, what am I trying to say? It's like a happy, you know, it's a happy marriage. You know, I like painting. <laughs> I like the detail. I like to get into this, the, the texture and the, the feel of the thing. And so, you know, and it just seems like that, that, um, you know, I've had some, you know, some, I get enjoyment out of it and I've had some success with it. So, uh, I just think it's a mutual, you know, it's a, it's a sort of a mutual thing. And, um, and, I guess it's uh, the reason or one of the reasons I just, you know, been drawn to still life um, and uh, that I stick with it, you know, here, you know, 20 years now into my career. Um, it still feels as exciting and fresh as, as ever, you know. Hmm. Well, I think part of that, though, is because you are evolving. Um, you're not doing the exact same thing you were doing and not that there would be anything wrong with that if you were because you even if you just kept doing what you were doing it would yeah. still be worthwhile but you went from that kind of work to yeah. this kind of work recently yeah so yeah. clearly uh, yeah clearly you uh your interests have evolved a bit yeah yeah I've just really just been going really hardcore back into the you know the old Dutch masters, um, you know, you know, 17th century Dutch painting, 17th, early 18th century Dutch painting has really just been, um, it's pretty much all I've been looking at, you know, the last several years. Um, it's like, I put all my other books away. I don't even look at them right now. Um, and I just look at my, my books on Dutch art. Um, you know, and I read about it and I just, so I've just immersed myself in that world the last few years. Um, these are um, inspired by old, you know, Dutch, uh, you know, gouache and watercolor. Um, th these are oil, by the way, that you're showing. But um, they were inspired by, uh, you know, gouache and watercolor studies that were done, uh, you know, during that time, um, you know, uh, usually of tulips, but, um, um, other, other plants too. Yeah. Um, they almost, so that, 
they almost feel like, and I don't want this to come off as uh, an insult because it's certainly not intended because I love them, but they almost come off like botanical illustrations or like a scientific book of, of flowers. But, but they're beyond that because they're so beautifully composed and masterfully painted. But there's this quality, you got the label on it, you got the label of the flower. I'm assuming that's like the, the Latin name for the flower that yeah. you have labeled yeah. there. Yeah. So what, yeah. what, what made you decide to go, maybe you don't see it the same way, but what made you decide to go in this way where you just study the flower instead of a flower with other objects on a table arranged in a traditional, traditional as in more, uh, more, uh, predictable way. Yeah. Well, I mean, <clears throat> you know, again, looking at, um, old Dutch, um, watercolor and gouache, um, there, there's a particular artist. Um, he's actually a bit earlier. His, his name is George Flegel. Um, F L E, uh, G L. Uh, I think some, uh, I think that's the right spelling. Anyway, he's a, um, I think he's actually, he was from around the area of Germany, but he was an earlier, early, uh, still life painter, um, you know, Northern, I guess you could say. Um, and, uh, he did still life paintings, but he also did these incredible, um, series of, I guess they're watercolor on paper um, and just, just flowers, um, all different things from tulips to like, you know, daffodils and just, a, you know, he, and I think there's at least a hundred of these sheets. I, I haven't seen them all, but he has them numbered and, you know, they get up to, I think they get up to around a hundred or so. And, and, you know, they're just so beautifully painted. I remember looking at them and just thinking like, you know, the, and these were done probably in the, I mean, I'm guessing early 1600s or something, but they're just so good. They just blew me away. And it sort of made me want to like, like, wow, like someone is just exploring a flower, you know, that deeply and describing it that beautifully. It just made me want to, it just made me want to do some of that myself, you know, um, which is, you know. I guess a lot, how a lot of artists get, are inspired, right? You see right. somebody that just, they, they just describe this thing so perfectly. And, and, and like I said, this is done, I think in watercolor and I'm like, wow, that is just so, it's, it's like moving. And, um, so, you know, I just, um, I just started, you know, making those, these little sort of eight, they're all eight by 10, um, most, most of them. And, um, and I, you know, decided to add a label on afterwards, which I thought was, um, you know, something that you would often see during, uh, you know, the time of the, the these um, these studies were done. You know, the type of tulip or whatever they would sort of label it for for um, uh, whoever the collector or if it was for a catalog or something. They would actually put the name of the tulip, um, you know, because obviously they were they were tulip crazed at the time and uh <laughs> mm -hmm. said they wanted to preserve, preserve that that tulip for i guess you know their records hmm. so now this one is a little bit different and i'm assuming this isn't an eight by ten no that's um that's an 18 by 16 painting um and that was sort of um that was done uh gosh when did i do that um I don't remember the date on that, but uh, that was sort of my first, uh, um, that was like my first, what I think of as my first kind of like real, like flower piece, mm -hmm. you know, um, sort of in that sort of Dutch tradition, um, sort of composing flowers from life along with flowers from studies and, um, you know, and, and not paint it all together. So in other words, you know, that bouquet, that you're seeing never existed that way. You know, it was just sort of a, a, a combination of um, different, you know, pieces being added piece by piece. And um, oh my gosh, that's brilliant. Yeah, thanks. And that's what I was going to ask you: is how in the heck do you do it? And you've you've kind of answered that. But 
Yeah. Okay, so I don't know. Is this a tulip up here? I don't know my flowers. Yeah, that's a that's a uh, that's a flaming parrot. Uh, okay, so I look at that, thing. and yeah. it's got an unbelievable amount of detail. And I'm trying to imagine how I would paint that myself from life, because it doesn't hold. I mean, a flower holds still in the moment, but within a half an hour, it's changed shape. So. Yeah. How in the world do you do that? <laughs> um, you know, there's um, one of the things that um, I, I was telling a class recently um, about, you know, I taught this, this subject to a class recently. And um, in one of the old manuscripts that I was sort of leafing through, they, they were um, – one of the one of the writers was saying that you know to be a flower painter you need to be fast accurate and have a a ten, what he calls it a tender brush meaning like i think he means like a like a, a a nice hand or but but basically that's it you have to just be sort of fast and accurate and and have a nice touch and um you try to get it <laughs> before it moves too much um there's different ways you can um there's different ways you can deal with it you can try to just paint it like that was pretty much everything you're seeing in here with the exception of um that red and white striped tulip um on the right i think everything else was painted directly from life just as it is um so that's one way you can just do it and just you know you deal with the changes as as they come you know if it's important to start um when you're doing a flower you know, you start with a section, you finish it, and if the flower changes, at least you have that to hold on to. Um, so I think that's that's sort of like one of the things I, I take away from flower painting is finish a piece while you can before it moves, and then go to the next piece and so forth. Do you literally finish a petal at a time? Yeah, yeah. So um so one, one thing I can do now, for instance, I, I, I didn't do this like for the first year, I was just doing flower studies, but now I'll take a photograph of beforehand mm -hmm. of the flower, in the position, like its beginning position. And if it changes in a way, I don't like it. Or, you know, like for instance, if I, you know, I go eat lunch and I come back and one of the petals is really folded down or it's like closed up. I can, I can at least have that sort of reference to go back to, you know, the sort of the beginning position. Um, but, you know, during the first year or, you know, a little bit more where I was just doing these studies, you know, I had a lot of flowers that, you know, I'd come back from a break or whatever, or lunch and it would be, you know, it was really hard to reconcile because the thing had moved so much. So that's always a challenge, um, with flower painting is, like I said, you have to be sort of, you have to be, you know, fast and, you know, pretty accurate too. And, um, sort of get enough information before it changes too much um, so you said yeah. fast but I, these don't look like they were done fast i mean you must be moving well, at 90 miles an hour <laughs> no they're not they're, they're they're not done fast um they're they're some of them are stable you know some yeah. of them stay pretty thin, but a lot of them do move and you have you know again if you paint if you get a few petals done you know a little section you know, you have that, you can, it's something you can hold on to, um, you know, and if, if other things move, you can, you try to sort of incorporate it. Okay. Usually it doesn't move. It, it, it usually doesn't really move enough to affect what I've already painted. So that's, that's, that's why I tried to finish a little piece at a time. Um, so I, you know, at least I have something finished. It'd be kind of hard. I feel like to try to like paint the whole thing sort of, like as you go and try to bring everything to a finish right at the end. I don't, I don't, that to me would not work at all. Yeah, no, I yeah. can't imagine it would. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I find really interesting about this is it's, and I think it's due to the fact that you're improvising so much in that you're bringing in one flower and then another flower, another flower, and it becomes this kind of Frankenstein flower pot um yeah is it's got this almost uh animated quality to it where it's like the flowers are characters 
in a big on a big stage you know yeah. they're almost some of them are almost kind of serpentine like they're coming out and saying something and i don't i don't know that that's what you intended it to look like but i think it gives it this humanity that you often don't see in a more static flower painting that might have been done from a photograph that you just captured it all at once just as it is yeah yeah i mean it, it is you know a very different process of like um you know before i was doing this type of flower painting i was doing more um more direct flower painting so if you you know if you scroll through my website and you see and you go back a ways you'll notice that um you know several years you'll notice the flower paintings like you know, around this time um you know any of these you can just pick any oh, of yeah. these are all more, more direct a lot looser um you know a lot uh, say less attention to like finer detail um you know a little more brushy whatever you want to call it um you know so every you know again painted direct fast you know a lot of these were painted in a few days um you know really just whipping that brush around and, and um working fast um you know it, when you if you look at the contrast between this painting and you know the newer floor work there's just a lot more detail and more attention to form in the newer work okay um so that that's that's really the sort of one of the main differences it's just i this is sort of like um sort of diving into a, a sort of a deeper a deeper level deeper level of understanding of the flower and its forms and you know its texture um as opposed to sort of just like more surfacey or you know capturing the light or you know a gesture this is just a little bit deeper than that or mm -hmm. i mean it's a lot deeper for me for me it is but um you know so yeah it to me it comes off yeah much much deeper much more intimate i mean this one here um van <laughs> how do you pronounce that van who's some <laughs> well I, it's i mean it, it and a way an American would say it would be just Van Heisem's tulip. Uh, you know, I, I think Dutch would be something like uh, like Van Heisem or something. Hmm. You would say that stress that you and the, I think that's how they would say it. But I, I just I just call him Van Heisem. Um, yeah. Hmm. But they're even down to the little drops, the little droplets that yeah. you have. So much attention to detail. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's unbelievable. I mean, do, do you literally <laughs> spray water on them and then capture that? Or have you kind of developed a shorthand for that sort of thing? Uh, both. I mean, often, though, I do spray. I have a little spray bottle and I'll, or dropper. I'll, I'll drop water on it and see how it collects. And, um, you know, I've done enough droplets, too, to sort of know how they, you know, kind of what they do. So mm -hmm. if I can't get one. If I can't get one right where I want, I can kind of make it up, you know? Yeah. Well, there, it just adds so much to it. It's really, yeah. really interesting. Well, let's look at some of your old work just to contrast it. So sure. obviously we've just contrast the flower and I'll be honest, personally, I've, as you know, cause I own two of your paintings. I love all of your work, but I really do like where you're going, where you're getting m more intimate with the flowers. Um, I just wanted to pull that one up as contrast. This one seems sort of like halfway in between. We are starting to get more detailed and more intimate, but you're not quite yeah. where you are today. I mean, you know, it, it might not have quite the, the same level of attention, but, it, it, you know, it's close. It's, it's That was sort of like really one of the paintings where it was – sort of becoming apparent that this was, you know, at least it was it's becoming apparent to me that that was a direction I was going to go in and I was going to sort of move away from the, the sort of more painterly um, sort of Fantan Latour inspired florals. And I was mm. going to sort of move away from that. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of my favorites. That's beautiful. So let's see. So um, some of your older stuff, I'm going to go way back to, yeah <laughs> to the beginning to where ah here's the one that i own yeah you that's right yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. that one's over my fireplace absolutely love it nice. um yeah 
And then uh, there's another one that I own that I'm not sure you have that in here. Do you have the cheesecake one in here? Uh, no, it's not in there. Yeah. Unfortunately. So that's one thing I wanted to talk about too, is you don't even have the cheesecake one and it's a masterful painting, which suggests that you probably have a lot of great paintings that aren't here. And yet you probably have a hundred, 200 paintings on your website. Um, to me, it, that seems extremely prolific. Like you must be, <laughs> you must be painting all of the time. Uh, well, you know, it's funny. You're, you're saying that earlier before the interview, uh, you know, I don't feel prolific, you know, um, um, yeah, I mean, I feel like I've gotten slower if anything, um, yes, as same. I'm sort of, as I'm uh, sort of honing in more on sort of a deeper understanding of, you know, any subject, whatever I'm painting, um, and uh, slowing down. It's not that I'm not, I'm not a slow painter. Like I, th I think actually I, I I'm capable of painting quite fast, but um, I'm still slowing down. I guess because there's more, there's more, um, there's just more, um, you know, more to get into. Um, you're finishing them more. You're taking them further. It looks like. Yeah, taking them further. I'm also I'm also prior to like this painting, for instance, and and probably all the way up until about three or four years ago, I was painting with, um, I was painting exclusively with titanium white. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't I use titanium white anymore at all in my work. Um, so um, I think titanium white, uh, it, it lent, it, I feel like it lends itself to doing, you know, I don't know if more rapid painting, I guess you could say that, but I mean, being that it is so opaque and it tints so high and so powerfully, um, you know, you get more of a direct effect, um, mm -hmm. even though there is a sort of a layering process that happens in these works, um, there's a more immediacy. Whereas with lead white, I, I've, you know, I've learned, um, you know, to be a little more patient and sort of build building up build up the layers and and you know so there's a little bit more you know sort of a delayed gratification type of thing whereas with titanium white you know i feel like i could paint fast and i could sort of you know i could sort of see the thing come together a little bit quicker mm -hmm. you know sense i don't, I don't know if yeah you, it does it absolutely sense. makes sense yeah I mean, a lot of times you just can't leave something painted in in lead white with one layer because it's just too translucent. You got to cover yeah. it up. Although that yeah. being said, your paintings, even with titanium white, I noticed that when I got um, with the two paintings that I own is that you do seem to enjoy leaving areas somewhat translucent. And you can kind of see that here in this painting. Yeah. where you see a fair amount of uh, kind of an umber under painting on this fur and even on the table, right? Yeah, so there's always, I always try to leave like, that was, you know, a variety of texture, a variety of, um, you know, translucent and opaque and semi, semi-opaque or whatever you want to call, it. sort of, in other words, a variety of, of, of uh, types of paint, not mm -hmm. just flat, sort of like thick everywhere. I, I just, I, I tended to be always a thin, sort of a thinner type of painter, sort of. Um, so you'll find a lot of areas um, in my work where um, you'll find, you know, thin sort of scratched on paint, you know, just sort of scumbled on and um, sort of the under, the under layer or the under texture of the canvas uh, coming through that, you know, that was always very sort of common in my work. So, hmm. um, you know, you'll see many, there's many areas in this painting. You, you could see that, in, especially in the shadows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's very beautiful though. It gives it a very, oh, so it gives it, well, let me finish my thought. It, it gives it a very tactile quality, um, having the varying textures in it. So this is unusual for you. I mean, I've, I know you can paint the figure because I've seen several, but only several. 
not I haven't yeah. seen a lot. So what motivates you to take that rare or to 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 step away from still life on that rare occasion <clears throat> and do a portrait or figure? Uh, you know, I think sometimes, you know, you can get inspired by a particular model. Uh, this model I worked with a few times. Um, and, uh, you know, I just really enjoyed working with her. She had a great look. Um, and, you know, I was, I remember I was looking at, um, around the time I did this painting, I was looking up, um, uh, Orientalist work, um, you know, artists that worked in the Middle East and, um, um, so it was sort of, I had that in my mind. Um, and, uh. While this isn't particularly, I wouldn't call this any, uh, you know, I don't classify this as an Orientalist painting or any, or not, not attempt. It's not an attempt at it. It's just um, this sort of, you know, the idea of, um, you know, sort of a lone figure sort of in this really sort of barren um, sort of environment and, um, you know, uh, sort of draped, you know, if you can imagine if she was covered all the way, mm -hmm. you know, that section on the right, it, it could be something that was, it almost fit in that, that realm. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe not see-through, but, um, you know, not see-through fabric, but, um, you, you know, you could sort of, you could catch some of that vibe that, that, that sort of, um, you know, with the black, the black covering. Yeah. You know what, you know, what this makes me think about is the contrast that I don't know if you did this on purpose, but you've got this head wrap or shawl that in Middle Eastern cultures is, um, at least in large part, a, um, garment of modesty, right? Modesty. Yeah. Sure. But then yeah. it's all she's wearing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and I know. it's the only yeah. thing covering her, and it's translucent. So it's like, it's you know, look what's behind the veil, kind of a thing. I know. Yeah, was that your intention, or did it just is that just something I'm bringing to it? No, no. I mean, I, I think it's 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 funny you say that because you know I've had the same thoughts. Um, you know, when I was playing with it, this is basically it's, you know it's a piece of long piece of black chiffon, and you know, um, you know, I, I was thinking about like. You know, did I want to get like a, a you know traditional um, garment? Um, and I, I I sort of like the idea of the you know the interplay where you could see through parts of it mm -hmm. and and part you know parts of it you can't. And um, so I just decided to leave it like that uh, rather than having her in an all black uh, garment. Um, and um, I just, I, you know, it felt a lot more interesting. And, and, and also it wouldn't be so specifically, you know, have any sort of like religious connotations or anything right. like that. This is, the, you know, can just exist as it is. And, um, you know, people can see it how they, how they want. Um, but I think you're, you're, <laughs> you picked up on that though. And that's, that was very much what I was sort of thinking as I was sort of like, like setting her up and everything. Hmm. Yeah. Well, it's, it's beautiful. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So this is, uh, another one of those fur paintings. I don't, you, you blow my mind when, I don't know what it is about the fur, but this painting, everything is kind of blowing my mind. You've got that, the texture of the egg, the texture of the clay, the feathers, the fur. You're just, is, have you ever, this is an honest question. Have you ever, um, been presented with a texture that just you just felt like you couldn't handle and then you don't have to be modest here i mean be honest you know it, no it's it's a it's a good question um you know offhand i can't think of anything that that like right away um i know mm -hmm. i had a teacher once used to, I, I had a teacher at pafa who I think he, uh, he said his teacher from way back used to say that uh, like a styrofoam cup 
was impossible or something that that was like the hardest texture to paint or it was uh-huh. like an impossible or a, a styrofoam cup um but no i you know i i never tried painting a styrofoam cup i can i can tell you that but um maybe that might be a um you know maybe that would be a challenge but um you know i i think i tend to look for things that i feel like are translatable you know what i mean mm-hmm. like if there's something that was just untranslatable to paint i i don't know if i'd you know if i'd attempt it because like you know paint paint has limitations obviously you know right. like, especially when it comes to color uh, there are certain colors that are just kind of really um you know, when I, like I was painting uh, yarns for a while and I couldn't get, like I had this hot pink yarn. I just like could not get that color. And I just, so I said, all right, I need to like find, need to find a different skein of yarn, you know? So um, anyway, hmm. <laughs> little things like that. Yeah. So when you approach a painting like this and um, and you've got all these different varying textures, um, can you tell me a little bit about your thought process? Um, I mean, I know the basics and, and maybe that's all we talk about. I don't know. I mean, it's basically just shape and value, right? But is there yeah. more to it than that when you come into something like this where you have these extreme, this extreme variation in texture? Or do you really, is it just as simple as shape and value and edges? Well, yeah, well... I think telling uh, something in my paintings that I think has always been sort of there, though I haven't always been able to maybe, you know, articulate it, but it's something I definitely know now. It's just sort of the, this idea of you telling a story with color. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so a lot of my paintings, when I, I, I go back and look at my older work, um, there's a, there's each painting, there's a, there's a color story and um, they tend to all sort of, you know, this, this story all tends to revolve around a theme of a, of a certain color. Um, And then, you know, so I usually have a, you know, it's going to be like a small number, usually like, a few colors that the, the you know like in this one for instance it's like basically brown mm-hmm. for the most part brown and white you know or tan tan and white whatever you want to call it sort of a grayish brown and white um but a lot of my other paintings you know it's really just you know a few main colors with maybe notes of a a tertiary color or something you know so it, it's it, i i sort of a lot of it is it's not texture is fun and that's something it's important that adds to the painting i think color is the thing that sort of or in this case you know in this painting a lack of color but um this sort of idea uh, the composition centered around this sort of uh, some sort of unifying color scheme has always been um something that's been um you know there for me and um you know i i guess at some point i realized that um but um i i just feel like you know when i look at my old work it's it was always there you know Hmm. so are you modifying color or are you really going out of your way to set up the still life and the lighting so that these color themes are present before you start painting or both correct uh so this is an example. This is a painting that was set up completely ahead of time, you know, in every aspect. So, you know, the setup and the lighting, um, is, this is painted under North light, by the way, mm-hmm. um, as you know, all my paintings are. And, um, you know, this was set up, this is an example of a work that would be set up ahead of time and worked out, you know, in all its detail. So that when I start painting or, or, or drawing first, but then painting, uh you know it's all there um and I, I there's no sort of mystery about what the colors are going to look like um so um hmm. so yeah the setup you know going through the setup and i'm putting objects down and moving them around and um you know that that's a that's a whole process and anybody that paints still life can can attest to that 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 sometimes happens very fast and 
you know, comes together, you know, like the snap of your fingers. Um, other times it takes a while and you have to search for it. Um, and, um, you know, I don't remember how this one came together. It was done a long time ago, but um, certainly, you know, I went through that process um, of, of, you know, exploring until, uh, you know, I found something that, you know, just sort of sings, sings, you know, sings at your eye, you know, when you look at it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and it really does. I love the tonal quality of this painting. Well, let's look at a few of your other more complex ones to see what you're talking about with the color, the uh, color schemes you're talking about. Yeah, and it's definitely apparent. This one, it's just uh, brown and blue, the whole painting. Yeah. Obviously, there are yeah. some other colors in there, yellows and greens, but for the most part, you're you're just dealing with two colors. Yeah, and that's what I do. You know, you know, this, this idea of the sort of color story, it's usually centered around, you know, a few main colors. Um, like I said, you'll, you'll see additional ones in, but you know, they tend to be smaller little notes, color notes rather than, you know, big expanses of, of, of color. So, hmm. uh, and you know, so, you know, looking, you know, you look through any of my work, you'll probably see, um, you know, you know, to really uh, red, yellow, and, and brown, right? Yeah, I love this series. I remember when you were doing these. Yeah, I yeah. I'm wishing was... I, I could afford to get another one of your paintings. <laughs> I could just decorate my whole house with your work. Oh, thanks, man. <laughs> yeah. Appreciate it. So how'd you get this little guy to hold still? <laughs> uh, he's taxidermy. Oh, really? Yeah, I, many, many years ago, I started buying taxidermy, uh, first birds, and I moved on to other creatures. But uh, that, that was a, well, probably one of my first taxidermy birds I bought. So this one here, um, cacti, oh my gosh, I've never seen this one before. It is gorgeous. But again, two colors, just red and green. <laughs> yeah. And it's almost really yeah. just a red painting, or an, a, a, a kind of a, not even red. Uh, what would you call that? It's kind of a a burnt orange kind of a painting which is a splash yeah. of green yeah yeah i mean basically like you take the green out i mean you're just dealing with things in the sort of orangey brown family right yeah yeah so um yeah i mean this is um you know these are just again this feels like looking at these i haven't looked at the some of these in a long time it's like um you know it's like seeing old friends or something or hmm. yeah yeah <laughs> it's just I, it's a, it was a different life when I painted these, but um, um, yeah, I still enjoy looking at them though. It's, they're nice. I still have those pots too. <laughs> 2010. Yeah. That's 12 years ago. Wow. So you yeah. said you have taxidermy, you still have these pots. I mean, what yeah. is your studio like? Are you just a hoarder or what? <laughs> no, not, not a hoarder. I, I have a nice collection of stuff, you know, yeah. like that I've collected over the years. I, so I just moved to a new house and new studio. Um, and, uh, I, I got rid of quite a bit of stuff, things that I haven't painted either in years or I've never painted. Um, I just got rid of a lot of stuff and I kept like this core collection of objects. Many of them you, you'll see in these paintings. Uh, I still have them. And, um, uh, so I'm not a hoarder at all. I, I, I have a, I just have a, I have a lot of objects, but they're, they're well curated. Right. You know, and they're, uh, you know, very thoughtfully curated and kept and, um, you know, um, every mm -hmm. once, probably every few years, I'll go through it and maybe get, get rid of something I, that I'm not using, but yeah. You, I mean, I can, I can imagine it would be so fun to be a still life painter and just hit flea markets and antique shops and frankly, anything, I mean, it doesn't even have to be that. I mean, the way you've turned bags of pigment into art yeah, is kind of mind That's actually spice. What's all oh, those <laughs> spices? spices. Ah. spices yeah. I got, see, when I was at, uh, when I was a student at PAFA, I had, um, when I graduated, I had my studio right next to uh you know my where i went to school uh, i was in the next building over and then walked down to the reading terminal market which is like a place where everybody go to, like you know go get lunch or like buy 
produce or whatever. And I just, I just saw a bunch of bags of spice and I just, you know, bought them and brought them back to my studio. So, you know, whatever you spend, you know, 10 bucks on spice and boom, wow. It's like, oh, there's a painting subject right there. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it was, that was like, you know, when I was living in the city, I was working right in the heart of downtown, you know, it's like you're right in the midst of all this stuff. And, you know, anytime I needed, you know, a subject, I would walk over to the Reading Terminal Market, which was literally like maybe three blocks or less, maybe two blocks from my studio in downtown Philly. And boom, I was like right there. And, um, you know, if I couldn't find something there and I wanted to venture out a little farther, I could go to Chinatown and, and hit the Chinese groceries. And, you know, they, they had a lot of like exotic fruits and vegetables that you wouldn't catch at, you know, your typical supermarket. So, you know, it provided for a lot of uh, inspiration and, you know, stimulation, like just sort of, you know, the morning, the morning before going into your studio, like your, your, your morning commute, you, you pop into the, 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 the Chinese grocery and, you, you know, you, you know, you buy a fish or something, you know what I mean? Just like mm -hmm. that kind of, you know, it was just a fun sort of a fun time, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, early part of my career. Um, yeah. Yeah. Now I suppose most of your subject matter is perishable. So you're not really ac yeah. accumulating a lot of things anymore, I would assume. Yeah, I mean, I still have all my objects. I, I'm not, I haven't painted a lot of them lately. I, I've mostly been doing, you know, you can imagine, uh, you know, from looking at my site, uh, last few years it's been really just flowers, um, mostly. So. Okay, so this one really shows your chops. I remember when you first posted this, I assume, I assume I saw it on social media, but this, I mean, is a gorgeous figure. And yet yeah. it's almost like a still life painting and a floral painting at the same time. It's yeah. just like, it shows every subject in one painting. Yeah. Um, you know, I, 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 um, I remember when I did this painting, I was at my, uh, my studio in uh, one of my Philly studios, and um, this this girl, her name's Gabrielle, she posed for me, and uh, uh, you know she was a great model to work with, and you know this painting, I, I don't know, I, I I've always been, uh, you know, I love the pre the pre Raphaelites, um, mm -hmm. and you know, um, you know the uh, Ophelia painting by Malays. Uh, I wondered um, if you were inspired by that yeah totally totally inspired by that um you know that painting i a number of years ago i got to see it it was in uh, washington dc and it's not it's not like enormous or anything it's like just it's sort of a nice size but um um you know definitely this was um you know inspired by that work and you know really to this point in my career this was you know I mean, maybe since I, I haven't really painted many figures since I did this, you know, mm. and, you know, I feel like this has, um, you know, I could probably argue it was the best figure painting I've done in my career. Um, oh, I think so. I just At least what I've seen. Yeah. 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 I wish I, I kind of wish I could get myself to do some, you know, another figure that would or something that would equal or come close to this. Um, I just, I haven't really, you know, I think you just follow your inspiration and, mm -hmm. you know, you, if it's there, it's there. And if it's not, then, you know, but, you know, so maybe one day I'll, 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 I'll do that. I don't know. Well, we'll sometimes, you know, I, I feel like I'm constantly chasing my own tail in that way. It's like you do one yeah. good painting and then you feel like you can't ever outdo it. Um, I don't see you that way. I think every painting you do is a masterpiece, but I get, I understand the feeling. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, you, it seems like you just got to go with, you know, what's inspiring you in that day. And then one day it hopefully happens. Right. Well, one thing, yeah. one thing I noticed about this, you say it's inspired by Ophelia is, I don't know if you did this on purpose, but it's, it's almost like with Ophelia, she's in the water and her face is just coming out, right? 
and you chose a, again your fur. Oh my gosh, um, I feel like you know you're good at fur because you keep painting it. <laughs> but <laughs> I just like I just like it. You know, yeah. I like the way it looks. It does. It yeah. looks so cool. But it's almost like the water because it's this really plush, thick fur that's kind of, that she's kind of inside of. She's kind of going into it. You know, if it yeah. were say a cow. Yeah a cowhide it, it wouldn't have that same feeling of swallowing her like the water swallowed ophelia yeah 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 totally i mean she does kind of sink into it <laughs> yeah was that intentional an intentional choice a, a little bit yeah yeah i could say that <laughs> and then the way you handled her hair as well it's the same it's just like the fur it's just but with the hair you know i'm working on some hair right now trying to figure out how to simplify it Somehow you struck this beautiful balance between simplifying the hair and it making it still feel very complex. And I frankly don't know how you did that, but congrats. <laughs> it's really cool. Thank you. Thanks, man. I, I appreciate that. You know, it was just, you know, all I can say is sometimes, you know, a painting, you know, and I'm, I know you've had them where you just feel like, you know, the elements come together and um mm. you know and you just and maybe you get lucky in some ways and maybe that was one of those paintings where it just sort of got lucky and uh things came together for me and um you know what can i say it was just uh uh i i i liked that painting a lot i remember when i made it and i mm -hmm. thought wow this is this is way better than anything else i've done and um um but I never really, <laughs> I never really followed that up, sadly, you know? Yeah, well, it's apples and oranges. You can't really compare it. It's a figure in still life. So, yeah. um, I mean, yeah, I, yeah. I, mean, I never, I was hoping that I would follow that up with another figure painting down the right, road. Right, right. Uh, sort of like be a, you know, sort of, um, you know, lead to something. But it, I just haven't gotten myself to, um, and that's, you know, especially with COVID now, uh, or at least that was a sort of like a hiatus where I didn't paint models for several years. Mm -hmm. um, so now that, you know, COVID's kind of waning, um, you know, I, I wouldn't have a problem painting a model again. Um, Wait, so, so you we'll did say, that whole thing from life too? Oh yeah, yeah, totally. Oh, um, come on, seriously? My, that's gorgeous. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I'll, I'll qualify that. Let me pull that, that one I, back up. <laughs> you're talking about the, yeah so I'll, i assumed you had photographed her that way i, I did photograph her I, I worked on a, a little a little bit while the model wasn't there yeah but 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 basically yeah i mean you know you could say like you know 90 percent of it or 85 percent was painted from life there was I, I you know to save a little bit of time and, and some expense uh I work on it a little bit when she was, um, when she was away, uh, especially with the dress and so forth. Um, but yeah, most, most of it was really done just from life. So. Well, that's uh, interesting just, because you did, your process was mimic the pre-Raphaelites too then. Cause I, they, they had it figured out in my opinion, they used photography where photography yeah. has its strength. And I don't know if this is exactly what you did, but to me, the only strength of photography is for the drawing side of it. And then, yeah, right. Sure. And then they, and then because there was no color in the photography, they had no choice but to bring the model back and observe yeah. the subtle value and color differences from life. Right. And that was yeah. the best of both worlds. It seems to me that's why the 19th century was just mind blowing. Yeah. Um, and is, is that kind of the approach that you took as well, or was it yeah. slightly different? Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I, I, I definitely, you know, when she came in, I took a lot of photographs in different positions. And, you know, I sort of use those as sort of like a thumbnail in a mm. sense, you know, sort of through, you know, a hundred or 200 photos and found a pose that I like. And then, then, you know, once she was, once I did, you know, I had her come back and then I started, you know, working, working her from life and, um, uh, you know, and then when she, you know, obviously there's, I don't know how many times she sat for me. Um, or, or, or laid in this, in this <laughs> case, um, laid down, she had a pretty easy job. She just had to sort of lay on the floor. Um, but you know, I, I I'm sure, you know, she got probably, a, a, you know, 10 or 12 sittings with her, I'm sure. Um, 
it's, it's just a guess. It was a long time ago, but I'm, I'm sure it's got to be at least 10 or 12 sittings with her. And, um, uh, you know, and then when I didn't have her, you know, I could work on elements, uh, um, you know, from the photos, but, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't feel like I had to do a lot of that. You know, I feel like mm -hmm. a lot of it, I was able to work from life and, uh, um, um, you know, but I, you know, I was able to use, use that a little bit and, uh, you know, it just, I guess whatever it worked out okay for me. So yeah, not just okay. Is this one sold? Yeah. Uh, so, so years ago, uh, which is, I think it was 2012. Um, I, um, I entered this and the, the first ever time I entered the, the, uh, art renewal center, uh, competition. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it was a, end up being a purchase prize. So, um, Oh, congrats. The, yeah. The, the Ross, the Ross family owns this one. Oh, and, they're so. so lucky. Well, I've got two of yours too, so I can't complain. I've been blessed. <laughs> well, um, all right. So I was going to pull up this landscape because this is maybe there's more on the website, but I've never seen you do a landscape before. Is this plain air? Uh, that's partially plain air. So I uh, basically I did about half of that painting mm -hmm. plain air, took it back to my studio. And then so I had mounted like it's kind of a boring story. But anyway, I mounted a piece of linen to a, a piece of um uh like foam core and it had warped really bad mm -hmm. so i so basically i i remounted it onto like uh or, or what did i do i think i remounted a piece of linen onto like a, a harder board and i basically repainted the entire thing from the study and then a photo of from the uh, part that i didn't fit yeah, so it was like a hybrid you know yeah so how so come I, you don't do I more mean, landscape uh, just time, honestly, time, time mm -hmm. and, and laziness, you know, it's, um, uh, <laughs> I, I, I love being a studio painter. You know, I, I wake up, I walk through my laundry room and I'm at my studio, I'm at work. Um, you know, I, there's something I really, enjoy, I enjoy being out in nature and the sounds and the breeze and the birds and all that. I, I love that. Um, So if I can get to that point, I'm happy painting landscape. The problem is the getting myself to that point. Is yeah. The, like a I lot totally of times relate. It's, it's the setup. <laughs> this, well, it's not even before the setup. The scouting, like mm -hmm. you know, I remember I used to go out to Missouri a lot, and I, you know, I'd be driving up and down these these dirt roads, like in the middle of nowhere, for an hour or two hours, looking for, you know just something that would like, you know, just, just looking for the right, you know, the right, um, the right scene, um, something to grab me. And, um, and then once you do that, then, you know, you get to get out all your gear and you, you know, it's just, it's, it, I found, I find landscape painting to be hit or miss, you know, sometimes I really enjoy it. Other times I have a lot of problems getting myself motivated to find, because I can't find, the spot that I like. You know? I go through the exact same thing because I just started. I can I shouldn't even say just started. I, I recently built a van so that I could go out and have it be more convenient and everything is already set up and I just jump in and yeah. go. Um, yeah. And because I because I'm like you, I just it just seemed like such a hassle. Um, when I say set up, <laughs> when I say set up, I mean, just walking out of the studio is part of the setup, going into the car yeah. like the, it's all that time that you could be painting or doing doing something in the studio. Um, yeah. and, uh, and then I've, I found that I do the same thing. I drive around for hours. And so every landscape painter I've interviewed, I've asked him the question, how do you choose a location? And it seems like those who are more experienced yeah. don't drive around for hours. And I know I want to have what they have. It's like, they see landscapes yeah. everywhere, but I don't know. I, I'm like yes. you. That's the difference, man. Maybe that's why, you know, I'm not meant to be a landscape painter. Um, you know, funny thing, most people don't know this, um, but th this is definitely true. The early part of my career, like 2004, 2005, 2006, I painted, I painted a lot of plein air. Mm -hmm. uh, 
2008, I did the Hudson River Fellowship with, uh, you know, the, through the uh, Water Street, or I guess it was maybe Grand Central at the time, but that's the uh, the landscape. It's basically a landscape painting. Uh, yeah. Red. So, you know, basically from, from the time I graduated, you know, 2004 to like 2008, you know, I painted quite a bit of like plein air landscape. Um, and most of these are, you know, I have, I have like the slide, you know, little slides, yeah. of them. but I don't, I don't have digital images. So maybe if I get converted one day, um, people get to see, you know, what I did, but yeah, I did, a, I did a lot of it, but you know, just, just my own, my, my own viewpoint. And maybe, maybe I could, could be better at it, but, um, I just don't think I do it enough to, um, to have this sort of proficiency that I, I think I need to be really good at it. Um, um, well, I think so, this I is know, gorgeous, maybe. but the really good at it part, you know, I, I think there is something just to, to being able to not drive around for two hours. That to me is, <laughs> yeah. So it feels so amateur. I'm like thinking, geez, what would Joe Paquette be doing right now? Oh, he would have a painting finished by now and I'm he still driving, be, yeah. you know? Yeah. That's, and that's the difference between like me and a seasoned landscape painter, you know, like they, you know, they can, they can find those compositions, you know, and I'm like, you know, I have my little viewfinder out and I'm like, you know, yeah. looking at every direction. <laughs> Yeah, and then a friend of mine, Josh Clare, who lives here in Utah, he paints his backyard over and over again, and then he and then yeah. he uh, he'll paint a snow mound right behind his studio. He'll just be like, I think I'm gonna go do a landscape painting, and it's a snow mound with a piece of grass sticking out of it, and it looks amazing. I know. <laughs> don't don't you wish you could find that same passion to do like like I wish I could find that same passion because I you know I look around, I have like trees and I have like nature yeah. everywhere around. Man, if I can, if I can get up the, whatever it is inside me, the, the sort of, you know, the, you know, get something to sort of well up inside me, um, to, then I would have subjects everywhere around. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you don't, you, know, you don't have to buy them, right. Or store them. <laughs> go out my back door and, you know, I have trees and go out my front door. I have trees and there's parks around here. And, you know, so there would be a lot for me to paint if I could mm -hmm. find the, find the motivation or find the, find the, um, you know, the, 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 the inspiration to do it. Yeah. Well, I'm certainly not trying to convince you because I think you're on the right path, but not that it matters what I think, but I think you should just keep doing what you're doing. Cause it's incredible. Here's some of one of those yarn ones you mentioned before. Um, yeah. if this doesn't happen to be the one with the hot pink that you couldn't get, is it? No, <laughs> no, no, I, no, but you know, it was around that time, you know, yeah. um, you know, Claudio Bravo is, is sort of looking at a lot of Claudio Bravo's work who did yarn. And there were some other painters, um, you know, sort of in that circle who, who were doing yarn paintings. Um, there was a guy, Gerardo Pita, who, did, or I'm not saying, I'm probably not saying it right, but he did, he's doing a lot of yarn paintings. Um, uh, there's, there's others too, but um, so I was looking at sort of a lot of, you know, that sort of circle of painters. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that, you know, the yarns, the paper bags, all that sort of, uh, again, the sort of inspired by the Claudio Bravo school, Claudio Bravo aesthetic, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I can see that, it, man, this one, again, it's that minimalist palette, just Brown and blue with yeah. a splash of yeah. green, purple. I mean, you've got every color in here, but they're all subdued enough that they're not taking attention away from the brown, blue overall yeah. composition. Well, you know, it's funny you say that. It, it, I, I think you'd probably find that in a lot of landscape painters that they would say, you know, the same thing that they look for, you know, um, not to say there's not more, there's more than two colors in a landscape, but you know, like big passages of, you know, value or, or certain color, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, uh, you know, you know, creating sort of shapes with, you know, whether it's the mountains or the, you know, chunk of sky or foreground, it, you know, but just sort of limiting it to, uh, you know, a minimal number of either main values or main colors or something that so.
so it, I don't know. It's probably not that different in that sense. You know, one thing about you is you're a brilliant designer. Um, because I'm I'm looking at this, and I keep looking at this piece of or this uh, ball of yarn right here. Yeah, yeah. And if that wasn't there, the painting wouldn't be half the painting. Like it, you just, I don't know what made you think to do that. And I don't think I would have made that decision. I would have probably made half the painting at, at the most. <laughs> but by putting in that, you've got all these gray yarns and then bam, you've got this really, really rich, saturated, almost, yeah. what would you call that? Like a aqua blue, turquoise-ish kind of color. Yeah. Um, it just really provides this beautiful focal point. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, yeah. And you know, again, I feel like I learned a lot about composing paintings from looking at the works of Claudio Bravo. Um, he was certainly one of my early heroes. Um, and, you know, you know, I just, I, I mean, he's not the only guy I looked at, but I felt like, you know, I never studied with him, but I feel like I studied his work enough to that, you know, he, um, uh, you know, he taught me indirectly, you know, mm -hmm. how, how pose, you know, and, uh, you know, it was a, it's a good observation you made that, you know, if that, that bright yarn wasn't there, you know, it just wouldn't draw your eye up there. And, you know, your eye would be sort of focused on more on the bottom where, you know, it was a little more colorful, but so, you know, and, and, and you know, I, I talked about it earlier, but this idea of color notes, you know, sort of a main color story with notes of color. And I think that's that's an example of something, you know, with that that colored yarn at the top and something you'll always see in my paintings, um, in addition to the sort of main thrusts or the, in the color story, is these little, little pieces of color here and there, just enough to catch your eye and keep your eye moving through, through the painting um, to grab your attention. And, you know, that's an, you know, a good example. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I could have put something else there, but I, I, you know, that, that was the, that was what was needed to sort of, you know, keep, keep the eye moving. Yeah. Yeah. It certainly does that. So do you <clears> find that when you're composing a still life like this, you get it? Cause this is big. I mean, that's a lot. I don't know. Let me see how big is the actual painting. So it's, oh, it's a big painting too. 32 by 40, which yeah. my guess isn't quite life size or is it uh no, no i don't think it was quite life size it's probably a little bit below life size yeah because but, a table um, would have been maybe 32 or 34 inches if it was life size right so that's yeah but yeah it's just a, you know a little bit below um, okay you know so, um so you know i don't you know it's funny i haven't worked that big in a while but um uh you know back then i was doing uh you know, a decent number of paintings that were sort of in this range, you know, I was doing sort of larger still lifes or a little more what you think of as sort of contemporary, uh, sort of more than that Claudio Bravo, uh, sort of contemporary realist type of school. Um, you know, whatever, you, I don't even know what you want to call that, Ch <laughs> Ch Chilean, Chilean Spanish realism. Um, uh, but, but uh, you know, that was... Um, around this period of time was, uh, I was definitely working larger for sure. Hmm. Well, the question I have about it is I'm trying to imagine if I were to do a still life like this, I would expect that it would look really good because it's big. It would look really good when I'm setting it up. But then once I start painting it, I realize that the space on that two dimensional canvas isn't, it's not coming off exactly the way I saw it in three dimensions. And I might find that I have to move some things around in order to make it work on a two dimensional space. Does that ever happen with yeah. you? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I mean, this, this, this was an example of a work I can tell you definitely. I mean, I know this work was, it was sight sized, you know, it was on stretched canvas. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, large, large, uh, stretchers and, um, stretch canvas um dr uh, drawn on paper first with pencil transferred through and then uh you know and then underpainted with uh you know like an eboche or you know colored underpainting um 
sometimes uh, I've definitely made changes where like I've, you know, moved things or painted things out or added things after the fact. Mm-hmm. Um, and especially more lately, like, you know, more recent work, I find I've been doing that more. But but back then I was, since I was painting more, um, or I should say I was painting less ephemeral objects, you know, I really spent a lot of time setting them up. So the setup, like, was probably the hardest part in a way, yeah. <laughs> you know, not, not the longest longest stage of it but you know like i spent a lot of you know a lot of time and attention to make sure every you know everything's pointed the way it should and you know nothing nothing you know no no detail was left unspared you know what i mean yeah so living in pennsylvania i mean these might be strange questions but i you know (laughs) i guess as another painter these are the kind of things i'm thinking about in Pennsylvania, yeah. if you're working from North Light, do you get frustrated when you get, because I mean, every other day is raining. Is it difficult to paint when the it's bright one day and dark another day? And You know, you get used to it, honestly, man, 20, 20 plus years. I mean, I've really been working under North Light since my fourth year at PAFA, okay? Mm-hmm. So my, my, studio, my fourth year studio at PAFA was North Light. So 2004, I mean, almost 20 years of working exclusively in North Light. I mean, the only time I don't is when I do teach workshops. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I'm accustomed to the shifts and changes. You know, the, the, really the most challenge that I run into is when, um, well, one, you get a rainstorm. It gets so dark you can't paint. And then two would be when you get, like, really bright sun interspersed with, like big billowy clouds and it keeps going back and forth and you get like, so you get really cool light and then you get like, you know, then like the, you know, light changes. Sometimes it can be like more golden. Uh, but it, 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 that, that, that can be a challenge, but a lot of times around here, you know, this sort of East coast, Pennsylvania, um, we tend to get a lot of overcast days. Now that hasn't been the case this summer. This summer has been really hot and really sunny, <laughs> like all summer. So I've had a lot of cool blue light. Um, you know, you learn to work through it, mm-hmm. and you learn you learned not to chase. You know, not to chase it. So you, sometimes you start things in a certain key. Um, and then the light changes and, you know, you don't change everything. You just, you, you know, I, I just said hey, it's practice and experience. Yeah. And, and it's really frustrate me, and, you know. Mm-hmm. But it's so I imagine your canvas is also being lit by the same windows, right? That's correct. Yeah. So if your canvas and your palette are also being lit by, say, a cool blue light from a sunny day, well, it, the color, I wouldn't think the color would be the issue as much as it would be just the dimness and not being able to even see what you're looking at half the time. Yeah, that's correct. So, you know, I have the same light on my palette, the same light on my canvas. So, you know, it's, it's, I think the, you know, the thing you just have to like find a way to reconcile is like if you paint, if you started a painting, and you had like really cool blue light and then then you get like a week straight of you know overcast you know like if I'm, let's say a white background or off white background well it might look really cool and blue or have like bluish tinge on it you know a nice sunny blue day blue sky day but then you know you get the overcast and you know you have like a nice sort of gray even light and you, you might find it's 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 actually a little, a little bit warmer you know mm. and you know, so, so what I'll do is, you know, I'll look at the weather, honestly, I'm, you know, just pull out my iPhone, go on the weather app and, you know, like, you know, uh, okay, well, it looks like we're going to get three or four days of, you know, um, uh, you know, overcast or something. <laughs> I can, then I know, you know, I can kind of expect that I, I'm, I'm going to have some steady light to work in and, you know, hmm. generally I don't really find it to be a problem though. I can tell you that. Okay. You know, it just occurred to me as we're talking, I was interviewed uh, on a podcast. Oh, now I'm drawing a blank. Um, the Creative Endeavor 
Are you familiar with that podcast? The no, creative endeavor, no. Andrew no. Tischler, Andrew Tischler is okay. the artist and he paints in okay. Australia. Okay. And it occurred to me that Australia, it would be South light. Yeah. 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 It never even occurred to me before. I don't know if that ever, ever comes up in his conversations with artists. Um, yeah. Yeah. Isn't it strange? I know. Yeah, it's funny, it's but bizarre yeah. to think about, cause that's like such a part of our vocabulary, North light, North light, North light, North light. And then the other, the other side of the world, do they just, just ignore that word and just switch it with South, even though all the books say North. That's interesting. I've never thought about I it know. before. Random, yeah, random I mean, thoughts. I mean, mm. There, yeah, I guess it, it'd be, any, is it anywhere below the equator is South light? Is that, is that the deal? I guess so. I don't know. I have to ask Andrew or, or yeah. Google it. Um, but I suppose yeah. if you're standing on the North pole, then everything all the way around 360 degrees is, is, uh, South light. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. anyway, what if you're right on the equator? What, it, what, what if you're like directly on it? Like then what? I have no idea. Then it would, then it, <laughs> wait, then it would probably, okay. Now, well, this is a major tangent. Let me, what would happen then? <laughs> That's a really good question. Okay, we're gonna have That's to Google movie. that. We're gonna have to Google that. Yeah. That's really interesting. Anyway, um, okay, so I had another question for you before it got, got off on that weird tangent, but um, now I can't remember what it was. Oh yeah, I remember what it was. So I, we had talked earlier about, um, or I'd brought up that I think that you're prolific. So I'm curious, I know you don't see yourself that way, but that's how I perceive you. And so I'm kind of curious what your daily schedule is like. I mean, how much painting are you able to get in? How much goes to, f you have kids, right? I do have two yeah, kids. Two yep. kids. And so how much goes to family? How much goes to paying bills and marketing and all that kind of stuff? Well, when you say how much goes to family, what do you, how much of what? Time. Like money? No, no, no. Time. Time. Um, yeah. What do you make? What do you make for a living and where do you spend it? <laughs> oh, man. Well, all the money goes to the family. For yeah, sure. exactly. I can tell you that. Um, so, yeah. So this is, is actually, okay. Right now, let's see. Right now, I'll tell you roughly like my current schedule, if normal, if uh, in best case scenario, I'm painting Monday through Friday. And I probably, uh, so I dropped the kids off at daycare um, at, let's say eight, 8.30. Um, and then they, they get home by, you know, 6, 6.15. So I have that that period of time Monday through Friday to paint. Mm -hmm. um, now it doesn't always work out that way. Uh, obviously, when the kids are sick or something, I'm you know I'm on I'm, I'm that's then and I'm on dad duty right. So I gotta I gotta take care of a lot of you know. So this past year I've had to miss some time with uh, my little boy Brad. He had COVID uh, at one point. So at the, at that point when he had it. Uh, you know, and the they care the the he had to quarantine at home for ten days before he could come back. So that's ten days. I was straight. I was home with him. Uh, I couldn't paint. Then so anytime the kids are basically sick, I, I'm you know I'm home with them. And then also, uh, I did a show last year in Boston. Okay, so after my show, we basically um, around that time we moved to a new house. And I basically didn't have a stu I didn't paint for about two months after that because I was moving out of my old studio into the new house and new studio was being built. So I had about a two month gap where I, I didn't really get to paint anything. It was just like December, January. So I got to start working again in February. So I missed probably between that gap and, you know, being home with the kids, I probably missed like you know, a good amount of painting time this year, probably <laughs> close to three months of painting time. So, you know, I feel like in that, in that sense, you know, it's been a sort of a tough year for me. Uh, you know, I'm not accustomed to missing that kind of time. I'm usually like historically, if you go back over since the beginning of my career, you know, I've always been at least five days a week uh, as a painter, you know, full time. 
when do you fit in all the business stuff? I feel like that eats up a ton of my time. Well, you know, that, that eats up time too. Um, I try to do stuff at night when I can, mm. um, you know, after the ki after Brad is in bed, Brad, Brad's young. He's, he's like, um, he's a little over two. So he goes to bed early after that, you know, my wife, charity's home. She can help out with my other, my uh, other child, uh, Chloe, who's five and a half. Um, then, you know, I can sort of catch up, you know, whatever emails or, you know, updating websites or, you know, whatever I have to do, social media posts. Um, you know, I don't have a big operation. I'm not, I, I think you're, you're running a school if I'm not mistaken, right? I am. Yeah. So, I and mean, I'm of course just talking about the, you know, just talking to clients and yeah, just the stuff that you don't even think about until you become an artist. You mentioned a few of them, you know, already. Yeah. I mean, I, I try to do as much as I can of that after hours. Yeah. Um, you know, but, but some things obviously like, you know, you know, stupid things like, uh, you know, the, you know, we have a repairman coming during the day. Like that's what I'm talking know, about. That kind of stuff. It you know, kills you. Kills you. Yeah. Like you're in the middle of painting. Oh, the repairman's here. He's got to fix a dishwasher. And, you know, so there, that, that, that happens. Um, and you know, I also teach too. I also teach, uh, in person again, I, I, this year, especially I finally got back into like teaching in person. Um, actually out of Dot's place in, in Bucks County. Oh, are you close to her? Yeah, I'm about an hour away. So I you drive I, all I, the way over there. Well, it's only an hour for me. Oh, that's a that seems like a long way to me. <laughs> well, you know, I, the East Coast is different, though. When I grew up in the East Coast, I remember like the, the best mall. We, I lived in the Hudson Valley. The best mall with the, was the Poughkeepsie Galleria, and it was 45 minutes away. And everyone thought that was like driving to Florida. I gave it so wow. far away. Then I, it, you know, and then I come to Utah. I mean, I'm sorry, I got that backwards. It's like, it's like nothing to drive there. And then I come to Utah right. and 45 minutes is like driving to Florida. It's like, right. uh, we don't drive anywhere here. You know, it's all relative. Yeah. yeah because <laughs> what, I, I look at it like this. I either do that or I'm getting on an airplane and having to fly to, you know, California or yeah. Utah or some. So, and like, do I, like, I don't like flying to begin with. And, um, I like sleeping in my, my bed is like super comfy and, mm -hmm. and you know, I have my, my family, my little kids here. I hate being too far, especially because they're, you know, they're so young. I don't like being away too long. Um, so to me, it's honestly, it's, it's nothing, man. I hop in my car an hour, you know, put on some music, you know, open the windows and it's, it's like a good time, man. You oh, know? good. I'll take that any day over flying. Yeah, that makes sense. And do you do that weekly? No, 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 no. So I just, I, I basically, um, so I've been teaching there. Like I did a workshop in the spring. I did two this summer and I'm going back out in November. So I'll go out. Oh, you know, so it's not regular. Out. That makes all the difference. I was, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Okay. Let's put this, if it was, even if it was like once a week, I wouldn't mind. I mean, I, I wouldn't do it every day, but, um, but I guess, you know, I'm only doing like, you know, I'll, small number of I gotcha. guess, you know, four or five, maybe six workshops a year. So, and how can people find out about those workshops? Are they on your website? Uh, yeah, I don't have, uh, although I don't have, uh, 2023 schedule yet. Um, okay. but, uh, my, my website, Carlo Russo art.com, um, usually will have my, uh, my, my schedule posted on there. Um, I'm always, I always try to be really good about that right now. Like I said, I don't have, 2023 official on there yet, but I'll, I'll, I'll get some dates up on there very soon. So check back in, you know, a week and I'll probably have it. Okay. And then also you had mentioned you might be coming to Salt Lake. Is that still happening? Uh, well, it's not for right now. We had, uh, initially we had postponed till November and I, I, I asked that we, you know, reinvestigate that in 2023. Oh, okay. um, I just, I just have a lot, um, there's a lot of stuff going on with, I, you know, I have a show coming up and, uh, I, after doing this sort of this, you know, grinding for the last few months, uh, pretty hard. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to a little break. Um, I, I don't want to have to fly out to Utah right after all that, you know, um, I'm just looking for a little, <laughs> a little, just a little downtime. 
So I, I'm we're gonna maybe look into that next year. Yeah, no, I totally get that. And um, so with your kids, you said they were five, five and uh, uh, Brad's two. Brad's two, yeah. So yeah, it it gets uh it gets even more crazy. Just fair warning. <laughs> Oh, man. As far as the time commitment, yeah, as they get older. So, I mean, you know, right now, the hardest part is that, you know, they're so dependent. Like, it'll be nice in some sense when they get older to be able to do things a little more for themselves. Like, they can make themselves food and, like, you don't have to change diapers and stuff That's like that. That's true. Like Brad, Brad is so dependent on us, like, for everything. So, he's, he's like, when he's here, he is, like, a constant work stream. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm um keeping out out of things you shouldn't get into um but anyway he's a i mean he is just so adorable i mean he's the cutest cute i mean every parent says that of course about their kids. <laughs> it's, it's yeah just so bloody cute. i'm just we're, we're just so in love with our kids and um but brad you know brad's a sweet little guy and he's at that age where you know he's like you know a little bit over two and you know he's you know, starting to get good at talking, but you know, it's a lot of baby talk, but he's, he's still like got the baby look sort of chubby legs and, you know, you get real squishable. <laughs> you, know, you could give him all the love and hugs and kisses you want. And he's just like cool with it. You know what I mean? He's cool with it. Um, Chloe is five and a half and you know, she, she, you know, she's got her limits, you know, you can't, you can't do too much now. She, you know, she just likes a little, her space a little bit more. So, you know, there, there's a difference there, you know? Yeah. And, and yeah, enjoy it while you can. So my kids are, my twins are going to be 19 soon. Oh man. Yeah. Wow. And they, one of them, the, my daughter who you met, who was helping me, she left though, but she's studying with me to be an artist, which is really oh, fun. Cool. And I don't expect yeah. it. I'm not like a soccer dad, art dad. Right. Um, <laughs> but it's fun because she's here with me. So she's kind of, I get to have her company daily. Yeah, um, but it's cool. interesting that whole that that thing about you know snuggling with your kids and whatnot and them just loving it. I remember yeah. my son who's nineteen. I think he was around fourteen when he just like just stopped coming in and giving me a kiss goodnight before bed. Oh, <laughs> that was the end of it. Just done. It's done. Yeah. And now now we can barely get a hug out of him. He's too cool for school, you know. <laughs> It's not even nope. that. Actually, he's a very humble kid. It's just like he's just not into the affection, you know. He's just like, ah, it ah, ah. It, you know, it, it, it's you know, <laughs> it's all go through it. I, yeah, I, it's I totally true. My, my mom, uh, my mom, she. Uh, I remember when I was twelve, the, we went to a movie. We went to go see Batman. It was the original Batman with, uh, you know, Michael. Not the original, but you know what I mean. The, the first one of the old ones, yeah. Batman, yeah, with uh, Michael Keaton and. Uh, Jack Nicholson is a joker. And, and so, uh, I was like, you know, I guess I was 12 or 13. I was like, Hey mom, I was like, you know, after the movie, I was like, look, you know, I said it nicely. But I was like, I think this is maybe the last movie we're going to go together for. <laughs> yeah. You broke up with your mom. <laughs> no, no, no. That's classic. She, yeah. I mean, I guess you could say that. No, not, not so much breakup, but more just like. That's what it more, sounded you know, like. <laughs> Um, I think it's time that maybe, um, you know, I start maybe going to movies with my buddies and maybe, you know, or, or like, you know, you mean, you mean it's time I need to see other people. Yeah. Like, you, know, <laughs> and, you know, at that age, like, you start, you're starting to get interested in girls and like, yeah. you know, like, you know, that whole thing. And so, you know, you don't want to be seen hanging around with mom, going to the movies with mom. It's just not as, not as cool or whatever. So <laughs> yeah, that's classic. So, you know, I, Wait, yeah. Oh man, I, I, that's the first I've heard anyone actually say it, like verbalize it. Say, "Mom, it's time. I'm done." Yeah, I'm done. Yeah, that was, <laughs> you know, she, she, she got it. You know, she totally got it. Your mom sounds cool. <laughs> she's a, yeah. she's a cool lady. So, how yeah, has, her. um, how has having a family affected your art career, and and even maybe even how has it inspired you, or has it weighed on you? I mean. Has it had an effect at all? Well, um, can't work as late. I know that I used to work later than I do now. So it does cut into my hours. Um, you know, 
you know, before I had kids or any like real commitments, like, I mean, I lived at my studio, like I would work there. I mean, I'd go, I mean, probably before I like had any, Thing, like really going on I probably had I would work like six days a week like, easily like every day all day eight ten hours a day can't really do that anymore it's more you know you know it's kids are getting ready to come home you got to kind of like start to you know even if you're in a groove you gotta you know right, I gotta start to wind down now I gotta clean up get get some food ready it's just different I, I don't it, it's not It's not good or bad. It's just different. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, totally know what you mean. Yeah. I found when I had kids, I it made it harder to have make take risks. Take risks. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, I was grateful that I took all the financial risks before they were born. And yeah. the biggest financial risk being, hey, I want to be an artist. <laughs> yeah. That's the biggest one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so what, fortunately, and I know you're in the same boat. Um, my career was fine and stable by the time my kids were born. So I could, I didn't have to take those major risks because I don't think I would have yeah. had the guts to with people depending on me like that. I don't know yeah. if you've thought much about that yourself, but I've, I've reflected back on that a lot. I'm like, Oh man. Good, yeah. Good thing. I took those crazy risks early on. Yeah. I mean, it, it definitely would have, um, I could see how that would change the calculus, uh, you know, having two mouths to feed or whatever, um, and, and so forth. Uh, you know, I, when we had Chloe, so five and a half years ago, you know, I was, you know, still had like whatever, 14 years <laughs> under my belt of painting, you know, I was at a, you know, good sales and, you know, so forth. So, I mean, but, you know, I, I don't, I don't consider like, you know, I don't feel like I'm, I'm taking risks. I'm just my, you know, my work's changed the past few years, but, um, so yeah, it's interesting when you're talking about, you know, taking risks, like I could have, like, I certainly could have kept on just painting still lives and sort of in that same genre, sort of same sort of aesthetic, but you know, your work still changes over time. Even I'm sure even you know, you, you've had kids now and, and, you know, you've had, well, they're a lot older, but still like, you probably find that, you know, you don't paint the same subjects that you did. Like, oh no. When you and I, first, right. You still yeah, have so, to like, take risks. You have to, it's yeah. just, they, it's hard. It's different. It's a different risk. <laughs> yeah. They're it's different. a different type of risk. You change your subject matter. Like I remember you were doing those sort of, those pieces, they were like, I don't want to say pop, not pop art. That's maybe that's, not, they were sort of like Norman Rockwell, sort of like inspired the girl with the paintbrush and the, you know, yeah. sort of flat backgrounds and you're doing more things like that. Um, but, but like, I don't, I haven't seen like paintings like that from you in a while. And, and maybe you're no. still doing, I don't know. No, yeah. not at all. So, yeah. So, but those are probably, I bet you those were, did well though, right? They did. I sold them all. Yeah, yeah. I sold them all. Yeah. So, so the it, it just goes to show you, you know, you're still, you're in a sense, you're, you're like, you're not static. In other words, no, and, no. And when I say risks, yeah, you're right. I think I'm glad you clarified that because I think to be a successful artist, you have to always be willing to take risks, particularly yeah. from painting to painting, because you can't yeah. paint for the sale. Because I, I don't know what have you found this but I've talked to a lot of artists that agree with this. Once you start painting for the sales, you stop selling. Like, cause no, you don't, you don't paint yeah, as well. Fun. Right. Um, yeah. so you just can't yeah. do that. You just have to, you just have to paint what you're inspired to paint or you won't do good work. So there, there is that risk that just is, yeah. it's just, you have to do it. But I'm talking about yeah. the one where you're starting from nothing. Right. And everyone's right. telling you, you can't become an artist and you're living yeah. hand to mouth until you start selling yeah. paintings, wondering if you're going to make it, um, yeah. make it in quotes, whatever that means to me, what I say, make yeah. it, I mean, be able to support yourself. Um, yeah. and so that one, I'm not sure I'd have the courage to do with a family at home, but, um, the other risks you just have to take, I mean, you have to take a risk on every painting or you're yeah, not an that's artist. A good risk. <laughs> every painting, every painting is a risk. I mean, cause it, it yeah. involves effort and, 
you know, investment of time and materials. And so, yeah, it's every, every, every painting is a, is a risk in that sense. And that's a good, you know, good way to put it. <laughs> yeah. I like every painting is a risk. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Well, yeah. um, so I've got one final question for you. Um, you've obviously been really successful and been able to, uh, support yourself and your family for 20 plus years now. Um, what advice would you give someone who is aspiring and wants to have a career in this? Wow, that's a good, good question. Um, I don't know if I have a short answer to that, but I can give you, you take like as long a as you want. Of... <laughs> <laughs> um, keep okay. So I'm just thinking from my own, from my own experience, and you know, this doesn't mean it has to be everybody's experience, but um, just some of the things that I think helped me along the way. Um, obviously, so you know, study with people that are aligned with what you want to do. So that's that's really important. Um, if you're like you know, I can be. Like in particular areas of interest, like for me, um, like I can get a little obsessive, like so um, in a good way. Um, but like art for me is one of them. Um, so when I get obsessed with a subject in art um, or a painter or something, um, I think that's a good obsession. And if if you can, so in other words, you you really sort of like dive into it and you live it and breathe it, and so. Um, don't, um, in other words, don't be like a dilettante about it, like live it and breathe it. Um, you know, like, um, when I was like in my early twenties and, and doing this and going to school, like I, you know, like to staying out to like two or three in the morning that like that ended, you know what I mean? So like, I, I changed my lifestyle around building my, my education and my, my skill set and going to school. Um, so that's another thing. Um. If you're going to school, um, if you're still in school or, or whatever, uh, or even if you're out of school now, um, try to keep your expenses <laughs> as low as you can because most painters, not all, there are some exceptions that that like shoot out of the gates like a comet, but most artists will not do that. Um, and you have to like grind your way up that hill. And that's, I've done the long, long, slow grind all the way up that hill. And it's been, you know, it's just been, a, you know, a steady, like, you know, just not like this, you know, mm -hmm. but like more of a, you know, slight incremental every year. And uh, so, so while you're, at, while you're not making a lot of money on your paintings or, or your paintings aren't selling for all that much, even if you are selling work, it helps to keep your expenses low because usually like when you're just out of school, your paintings don't, you don't fetch high prices generally. Right. right. So that's important. Don't don't uh, don't overprice yourself so you can't sell work because you, you need money in um, when you're a young painter. You need money to survive and keep painting. And if you can't do that, you're not going to be a painter. So um, um, that's that's important. And then, um, you know, even if that means living at home for a few extra years, you should do it. Um, and uh, and then. Uh, when you make enough to start supporting yourself, um, you know, whether it's teaching or, um, I mean, you know, I, I have no problem saying it. Like I did crappy jobs to support myself early on. Like in addition to painting and teaching, like I, I would clean, you know, do crappy, you know, I had like some crappy jobs I did to like make, make ends meet. So, um, um, you, you know, if you have to do that, just do what you need to do to keep painting. That's the more, the most important thing really is to keep painting and making work. And you're going to find that if your work's good and you sell it, um, you're going to probably make a hell of a lot more money painting than you would like cleaning toilets or sweeping floors, which is, you know, I did, I did that while I was a young artist, you know, I cleaned bathrooms and vacuumed and mopped and, you know, um, and I make a lot more as a painter. So <laughs> paint, try to make paintings. And you know, that. so whatever, if you need to do other work to do that sometimes, that's okay. Just, but keep keep it going. Um, 
you know, I know that Ellison is very sort of, you know, not very profound, but it's just no, like very that was practical. all good. That was all really good advice. I just, think, yeah, just very practical stuff, you know. So, mm -hmm. yeah, no, that was great advice, and I appreciate it. Yeah, Carlo, and it's been awesome talking with you. It's been a great conversation. Great. I I appreciate you being willing to do it. Oh, it's a pleasure, man. It's great to catch up, man. Thanks for tuning in to the Undraped Artist Podcast. If you enjoyed it, subscribe. And if you could, leave a comment or review. That really helps the channel. Please share the show with your friends. And if you're feeling generous, consider a monthly donation at theundrapedartist.com. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next week.